Okay, let's go through the list. Black tabletop, check. Black gloves, check. Vintage model kit to build and review, check. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 148 scale German Porsche King Tiger Heavy Tank. The model that we have here is built for my own personal collection and it's not for sale and or purchase. Now frequently I mention these smaller scale build videos that I often take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. However, with this model being 148 scale, this is not a scale that I actively work in in regards to commission builds. If anyone is interested in having me work on a model that is in the scale range that I just mentioned that I do offer commission build services in, that is an option I can be reached through the email address which is listed below and that's info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here is built predominantly out of the box, however it does feature a few little custom add-ons and modifications that I made during the build to bump up the model's accuracy. We'll be going over all these modifications as well as reviewing the original starter kit in this video. So stay tuned because there's going to be a lot of cool info coming at you. To start off this video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the Panzerkampfwagen Tiger Alf Bay, which is more colloquially known as either the Tiger II, the King Tiger, or if you are a British persuasion, the Royal Tiger. This vehicle has its roots back in 1942. Around this time, the Tiger I entered into full production and was being fielded by the German army on both the eastern and western fronts. As powerful and imposing of a vehicle that the Tiger I was, the vehicle really was, design-wise, stuck in previous generations of German tanks, namely the Panzer III and Panzer IV family. If you look at those three vehicles together, you'll see similar design cues with their overall construction, namely a flat-sided box-type format with, that comprises the tank's upper and lower hull. Armament-wise, the Tiger I, of course, was utilizing the very powerful 88mm gun, which is known to be a really good anti-tank weapon. However, the Germans figured that at some point the Allies are going to start developing heavy tanks of their own, which the 88 might have difficulty in penetrating. With this in mind, the German High Command decided that perhaps they might start looking into developing a new heavy tank to replace and succeed the Tiger I. This new tank design was going to be a departure compared to the other designs that were previously thought of by the Germans. This new tank was going to utilize brand new current state-of-the-art technology that the Germans were incorporating in their new generation of tank designs. This stems actually from the Panther. During the time when the Tiger I was design was being finalized and was entering into full production, the Germans adopted a new medium tank and this of course would be the Panther. What was unique about the Panther was unlike the previous tanks that came before it, which was again flat plate construction, the Panther borrowed heavily from the T-34's angled armor plates. With the experience the Germans saw from the Russian T-34, they saw that this was really a good idea and they took that concept and ran with it and used it on the Panther. Well, for the new German heavy tank, they were going to incorporate this type of feature as well. Along with the slope plates, the vehicle's armor thickness was going to be even thicker compared to what is seen on the other vehicles of the period, namely of course the Tiger I. For the main armament, a single 8.8 centimeter KWK-43 gun was to be utilized for this tank. The KWK-43 had a higher velocity 88mm shell compared to the standard 88 which was used on the Tiger I. This armament was going to be more than adequate with dealing with the current generation of Allied tanks which were being encountered at this time, along with the new heavy tanks which were still on the drawing board at this point of the war as well. When the German High Command announced this contract, just like with the Tiger I contract, two German firms came up to the plate. One was Henschel and the other was Porsche. 
Porsche saw this as a way to basically redeem himself from the Tiger One contract, which he recently lost to Henschelon. During that contract, Porsche entered a prototype and it failed miserably compared to the Henschel rendition. He decided this was a clean slate in order to go after and win this contract. However, Ferdinand Porsche, being Ferdinand Porsche, decided to dust off his overly complicated gas electric track propulsion system, which was used on the Porsche Tiger One prototype and was also used on the Elephant Ferdinand tank destroyers, and incorporate this in a new designed sloped armored hull. Henschel, on the other hand, decided to basically go with a tank design which was more traditional with its overall layout and configuration, not to mention propulsion system. The two designs were evaluated by the German High Command, and unfortunately for Porsche, just like with the Tiger One contract, the Henschel design proved to be the more pragmatic and the more practical of the two, and this was the one that went into production and was fielded. This was the vehicle, of course, that we would know as the King Tiger today. Where this story really gets interesting, however, is with the turret. You see, Ferdinand Porsche had nothing to do with the turret's design. The turret was solely designed by the German firm Krupp. This new turret was going to be vastly different compared to the designs that came beforehand. The turret was going to be much larger in its overall length and this primarily had to do with the interior space needed for the larger KWK main gun but also with the rear portion of the turret being devoted for an ammunition magazine. The new design turret was going to have some really nice slope angles to it. So steep in fact that in order to mount the commander's cupola, a blister needed to have been incorporated into the one half of the armor plate. This vehicle also had a rounded bow section on the nose with a very narrow main gun mantlet. This turret's design was approved by the German High Command and went into production. 50 of these units were produced. However, shortly after the turrets entered into full production and were beginning to be mounted to hulls, some drawbacks of the design were beginning to be noticed. Namely, with the front armored section, because of the bulbous shape, it was deemed to be a weakness because it acted as a shot trap. Another area to be improved upon was with the side portions of the turret. Because of the severe angles, there's that blister for the cupola that I mentioned before, and because of this extra portion over here, for the foundries to press and roll this type of feature into the armor was deemed to be too time consuming and really rather unnecessary. Another area that could have been revised was with the location where the turret makes contact with the hull. On the early pattern turrets, there is a ring found on the hull that needs to be fitted in order to elevate the turret in order for it to be mounted appropriately. The engineers at Krupp went ahead and took the vehicle's turret design and tweaked it in order to overcome many of the shortcomings. First and foremost, the front portion of the turret was completely redesigned, replacing that rounded bulbous type appearance and replacing it with a flat, vertical, thick slab of steel. The mantlet was also redesigned in order for it to mount to this new profile of the front turret. The side angles were flattened slightly. By doing this, you actually increase the interior space and you remove the necessity of that large bulge which was needed on the side, which makes the turret actually easier to fabricate. The turret's height was also tweaked, removing the necessity of having that extender ring which was need to be affixed to the vehicle's hull and this too sped up production and used less resources. The remainder of the King Tigers which were produced from that point onward to the end of its production run were utilizing this new turret which is why they are known as the production turret. However for some reason and this is probably something that happened post-war these new turrets were known as the Henschel turret and Coincidentally, the first 50 turrets that were produced are known as the Porsche turret. Which again is very odd considering that Ferdinand Porsche had absolutely nothing to do with the design and implementation of this turret.
All of the 50 turrets that were produced were fitted to hulls creating completed vehicles. 49 of these did see active combat during World War II. However, only one known example is left in existence today, and that vehicle is housed in the Bobbington Tank Collection in the United Kingdom. Although that vehicle is very special in its own right because it is actually a mild steel prototype for the King Tiger. However, that information is really best discussed in another video on another day. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this vintage Bandai 148 scale Porsche King Tiger. Now these 148 scale kits from Bandai are very interesting. Like I said in a previous video, the Bandai 148 scale lineup goes all the way back to the early and mid 1970s. During that time, Bandai developed this huge, enormous range of 148 scale military vehicle models. Some of the attributes that made these models very unique was that first their subject matter was very wide and diverse, where you had everything from motorcycles with sidecars up to heavy tanks and everything really else in between. What also made these vehicles very intriguing was that not only did they have some very good, and I gotta stress this for the period, good surface detailing on them, but each and every one of their tank kits also had full interior detailing. Now, once I crack the model open, you're gonna see exactly how that actually was executed, but this was a staple on all of these 148 scale Bandai kits from this period. These kits here were fairly common and prolific during this time frame and were in production and had some good availability up through probably the 70s and even into the 1990s. They also went in and out of production from time to time. And like I also said in the last 148 scale tank video, 148 scale is just one of those niche fashionable scales that come in and out of vogue every so often, kind of like an article of clothing. During the run of these kits, they were produced first by Bandai in Japan, then they were released by another Japanese company by the name of Fumin in the 1990s, as well as even Bandai themselves have re-released these kits from time to time, but the tooling was, although it was the same, the kits were manufactured in China as opposed to Japan like the original kits were from the 1970s. Now, because of the kits for what they are, they are considered to be very collectible, and because of that, availability is not going to be nearly as readily available or as affordable as something in the 135th scale tank range. These models here are really, you're going to be paying niche and collector prices for them when found, or in most cases, I should say, and I'll touch upon that briefly in a second. For a while, it was fairly common to find these kits on a catalog, mailing catalog type retailer like Squadron Mail Order, <laughs> shows you just how long I've been building these things, but also generally you're not going to find these in your standard brick and mortar hobby shop, unless again it's tucked in the way in the corner or you just have a really cool god tier hobby shop in your area. Generally these type of kits you're going to be finding them either online or at some kind of a venue like a model show or some other type of a swap meet type setting, possibly even a flea market if you're lucky. Now this particular model here I acquired from, of all places, a military vehicle show about 10 or so years ago. So it's been sitting in the stash for quite a long period of time. So it's about time I go ahead and get this one built and add it to the build model collection. Now for prices, they could range anywhere from crazy affordable to insanely overpriced. This again depends on where you are, who's selling it, and really how lucky you are. These models here can go anywhere from 10 or 15 bucks if the person's at a flea market and doesn't know what they have, or possibly all the way up to even 100 or $150 a piece if you're dealing with someone who, quote unquote, knows what he has. So the, the price range is anywhere of a smattering in between. This model here, I actually lucked out. I got it for about 15 some odd dollars. Again, it just <laughs> depends on, on your situation, which is why I couldn't pass up adding this kit to my stash. 
Now, starting with the model's graphic design, this model here, I believe, is a second release version of this kit. The reason why I say that is because of some of the censoring which was done to the graphic design. If we recall from the Hetzer 148 scale build that I recently did, that model was a first generation and it did have the, shall we say, politically incorrect markings on them. This one here, Bandai did a little bit of some self censoring on the graphics and you will see that on some of the sections on the box where they would have been left uncut on the original release. Having said that though, this kit here is definitely probably older than I am and dates back to, I want to say either the late 1970s or possibly the early 1980s. I'm really leaning on the former. Starting with the model's actual artwork and graphic design, we have here the Porsche King Tiger. The coloring is a bit boring in that the guy just left it either in a panzer gray or I believe this is replicating a winter type paint scheme. The quality of the illustration though is very, very good. These Japanese artists, specifically during this time frame, did have undeniably some of the best box art renderers at the time. Probably second only to maybe Aurora, but that's a topic for another video. Now, the setting itself is very similar to the Tamiya box arts. We have a white background with just some text overlaid over it. And the font is typical for what you would find from Bandai. On the bottom here, we have a red stripe with some more information about the series and here we have a Roman looking eagle with a gray dot in the middle. Again, when these kits were re-released or reintroduced, they had some self-censorship done to them. However, these were shortly after the release of their first batch. On the side here we have some more basic information. Here we have a sample unit of one of the kits fully built and assembled. Some more information on what it gives you. On the side here, again, more self-censorship. We have here a Stahlhelm helmet instead of a wacky looking X. And we have the old Bandai logo, which was a little happy child. On the side here, we have some of the other kits that were available in the range. This is obviously this kit here, the Porsche King Tiger. We have a German Ochtenraden, a Stug with a shorter barrel, and an Elephant. Kit here was originally for 25 bucks and someone apparently was selling it for 45 a little while ago. This is basically what you're going to come to expect to finding one of these kits in the wild. Now the model is fully sealed with the tape that we have here and this is really the first time I'm going to open it up, well, since I've owned it. Now these kits here are also 100% injection molded plastic. These are as old school as you can get. The only thing that is not going to be injection molded plastic on this kit here are the tracks which are going to be the rubber band type. So without further ado, let me go ahead and slice this guy open. Cut anything I don't want. Okay, now hopefully it doesn't go full blown arc on the covenant mode on me, so we'll, we'll see in a second. All right, we have here an empty runner. <laughs> That's interesting that the guy kept it. Uh, clearly this model, of course, was resold you know, somewhere in its past, but apparently all of the parts should be in this box or this is gonna be a very short kit review. All right, here we have the upper and lower hulls. Starting with the lower hull, it's a single lower hull pan, basically like what you would expect for any King Tiger on the market as a plastic kit, but it does have its interior detailing. We have here the torsion bars. Note they are molded into the lower and fairly simplistic, but that's the type of quality one's gonna expect with the tooling found on this old kit. Here go to the swing arms. Note they not only did the swing arms, but they also did the little axis caps for the, the torsion bars on the opposite side, which is a nice touch I might add. On the bottom though, oddly enough, they did all the detail there, but the bottom is void of any sort of axis hatch detailing, but we do have the little happy Bandai Boy logo right here on the middle. Here we go, some more features. I believe the torsion bars are accurate where they go in this direction on one side and the reverse direction in the other. Nice touch. And for, again, what is this, 19... 70 something. This is actually something that would have been state of the art of the period. 
Here we have the upper hull. Now the side skirts are integrally molded in, something you don't see very often. The turret does not have any locking tabs whatsoever, so it's just the, the turret is just basically going to sit on this vehicle with use of gravity. And we also have here the front axis section for the transmission. Note the fastener detailing found in that unit there. The engine deck with their fan grills. Inside doesn't really have anything to mention. And they do have their torch cut lines on their puzzle sections found here on the armor plates. Note the fender work does have its strap details as well as the other type of rigidity strips that are found on these pieces. Okay, from there it takes us to the turret. Of course being a Porsche Tiger. It has the nice rounded front section, which was actually personally the, the version of the King Tiger I always enjoyed. On the inside here we have some basic fittings molded in. Nothing too advanced though. Note the rear hatch is just plated over and there's no interior hatch detailing on this. And here we have the, oh, that's the bottom, here goes the interior portion of the bottom shell. Note the pan seat that the commander would have, or no, that would be the loader. Okay, this runner here, just more odds and ends. Note how the bow hatches are actually not molded into this piece here, and I believe can actually be made to function. If you're clever enough with a soldering iron, there are the bow hatches there. Pretty ahead of its time for what it is. And some other detailing that we can see here. Note the gun mount. That appears to be the, I don't know, some kind of, probably the turret rotation equipment of some sort. Tow cables. They have their small cable details molded in. Again, nothing too surprising what we would come to expect today, but during this time period, this would have been like way advanced. Main gun breech. And some other bits and pieces. This runner here takes us to some more fittings, obviously interior fittings, ammo racks. They have their nice geometry and shape to them. Bow MG, rear armored plate with the jack block molded in, typical for kits of this period. I don't know why they always seem to do that. Uh, some diamond blade floorboards for the interior, for the fighting compartment. Note the basket detailing for the turret is really nicely done. Okay. Just a little runner of crew members. This is the same runner that was seen in the last Hetzer video that was recently completed. And this runner here is just purely comprised of 88 ammunition. Now this runner is lifted directly from the 88 kit, which was made by Bandai, again, from this time frame, which is why we have all of the ammunition, plus some spent rounds, and even the little ammo canisters that the rounds are kept in, and even some jerry cans for good measure. Obviously, most of this runner is not going to be utilized, but the rounds will be used to load up the internal magazines on this vehicle. Let's see if I could get them in focus. They're molded on this rendition here in black, which is different, usually I've seen these in tan, green, dark gray, so the colors vary from kit to kit, which is always fun to counter when you're opening these things up for the first time. This runner here gets it some more interior pieces, such as the Maybach HL230, as well as the transmission. It's gonna be interesting to see exactly how detailed the Maybach is since a lot of the detail components typically on these Bandai kits tend to be, again, on the more simplistic end, as opposed to some of what we'd expect on more modern kits with full interior details like today and even within the last you know, 15 or 20 years or so.
Here we go with the idlers. Detailing looks pretty good on them. Some people might say they're a bit chunky, but again, for a 40 plus year old kit, these are actually pretty good. And here go the sprockets. Overall, not bad. Last runner is the road wheels. We also have here the decal sheet. Now I'm just gonna come out and say it, these decal sheets are probably not going to be used. On the last Hetzer build that I did, the decal sheets were definitely a problem. So they just, more likely it's because of the age of the markings. These I'm probably just not even gonna attempt it and just pitch them in my spare bin. So if you're seeing this model built, in the beginning portion of the video and it doesn't have any markings on it, you'll know exactly why. Now here go the actual road wheels themselves. Note the quality on them. Which is pretty good. You can even see all the hubcap details and fasteners. And here we have the Bandai logo and marking. Note it says made in Japan on the on the later releases of these kits in the 90s it would have made in China on them so that's one thing to look at if you're buying one of these units as a collector piece. Further down deeper in the box takes us to the main gun. Two piece assembly quite part and parcel for these model kits. Note the really elongated muzzle brake here on the piece but you know, it's part of the charm of these older kits. And at the very bottom of the box we have here the track bands. Typical in quality for the Bandai kits in the scale and of this period. They do have their surface detailing molded in. They even have the little ice cleats found on the top portion of the tracks. My opinion these are nicely done for again the age and scale. Now just like with the Bandai kits of this period, you'll notice that there are no interior detailing whatsoever outside of the guide horns. So this is typical for these kits of this period. And that is something that I can perfectly live with. Same thing with the opposite track here. And anything else in the box? Oh yeah, just a little front cheek piece of the Porsche turret. With its little pissed off looking eyebrows. And last but not least takes us to the instructions. Now just like with the Hetzer, the instructions are a product of their period. Right here, instead of having just a box art or some other black and white image of the vehicle, we have a diorama. There's the Porsche Tiger that this kit is, and there's also a Wesp, which again is another vehicle from this lineup. Not to mention all of the, the Kubelwagen and the infantry that we have here. Because again, Bandai basically had the entire ecosystem for the 148 scale lineup. The gold ink here is for the name of the tank. Interesting. Open it up and yep, this is basically what these old instructions look like back in the day. Here we have the engine where we have a built sample just to show you what's supposed to look like one's done and here goes some basic drawings or sketches of what the parts should look like during assembly. You should basically get the idea on how all of this goes. Starting with the model, suspension takes us to the running gear. All of the suspension components that you see on this model are stock supplied with the kit and were utilized primarily out of box. And in true ECA fashion, all of the Zerg fittings that are found on the model are painted in red. This is a common practice I do on just about all of my AFV vehicle builds and it's one that a few people do tend to forget on their builds that I've seen on the internet. Which is always funny because these Zerk fittings are molded into these pieces. Even on this old kit tooling here, 
these Zerg fittings are integrally molded in, and it requires absolutely nothing on the builder to do other than with a little swipe of red paint to just paint the little pieces on them to further make them pop. Keep in mind on the real vehicle, this was done as well. So it's just one of those simple traits that are integrally molded in that people tend to overlook. But if you do it, your model will definitely look a lot more improved compared to leaving it over painted. With any luck, with this lighting over here, you should be able to see the red painted Zerg fittings which are located on the center portion of the hubs on the King Tiger, and this is true for both sides of the vehicle. While on the row wheels, this brings up with their installation. And on this model here, a little bit of finesse is going to be required by the builder in order to get the model suspension fully mounted to this vehicle. You see, on this model, the side skirts are integrally molded into the upper hull. And on this model here, the upper and lower hulls are permanently glued together, forming one piece, which when it comes time for the suspension installation can lead to some difficulty, namely with the track. Now, on my builds, the track and the suspension is the very last thing that gets mounted to the vehicle just before the model's completion. And this actually is pr quite different compared to the way I've seen several other builders on YouTube and on the internet build these models where they do the opposite where during the build, even before the model has a drop of paint on it, they install fully the suspension, which includes the row wheels and the track. And honestly, I think that is completely nuts. It's just, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. And the reason why I say that is because, well, simply put, you're not going to be able to get these components thoroughly painted. I don't, I just don't know how people do that, but it's just not going to happen. On um, my builds here, I like to get a thorough coat of paint and weathering for that matter on all of the surfaces of the suspension which not only includes the portions on the front of the wheels but the middle sections, the rear sections, the swing arms, the sprockets, and even the lower hull and sponson. If you think you're going to be able to fully assemble the suspension with the track no less and think you're going to be able to get all these thoroughly painted, well I got a bridge to sell you because that's going to be literally impossible. And on this model here, with the track, it's also going to make things a little bit more troublesome. Just like with the row wheels, the tracks need to be painted completely differently compared to the rest of the suspension. And like I said before, people, I don't know how they do it, but they install the track and somehow think that they could get into all these fine nooks and crannies over here on both the top, the bottom, and even the rear section with a paintbrush somehow and yeah, that's the, if you think that's going to be the case mm, you, may want, you might want to rethink that. So because of that on this model the track needs to be fitted on. Now with the side skirts in the way and with the track being a single piece assembly that's going to be very tricky. So on this model the way it's done is you have the bare suspensionless hull and you take the track you carefully wrap it around the sprocket here because the teeth do need to time into the little holes that are found on the corresponding sections on the track links. And then you basically slip it in from underneath and around the, the torsion bar suspension. It was actually pretty doable and then from that point you start assembling the row wheels as you would as per the instructions. On this model here, however, I did encounter a small little snag with one of the rear idler wheels where the tension on the track actually snapped the rear idler mount lug. And this is something that can happen on not just this model here, but on lots of other models on the market, specifically ones that tend to have stiffer single piece vinyl tracks. If this happens to you, you're Basically, the only bet you have to do is you're going to have to put some kind of a metal pin either through the shaft of the broken stem or you have to replace the stem together with something made from metal. Simply just putting a little drop of glue on this location over here is simply not going to cut it and it's just going to lead to disaster. So on the broken axle, I went ahead and replaced it with a metal wire where I pin viced it into the model's hull and then I was able to get everything repaired. Once it was fully repaired the track or I should say the idler went on without any problems and it's more than durable enough at holding the tension of the track that you see here. While on the running gear I want to point out a trait found on this model here which is a common thing to come across on model kits from this era and this is not just true for this kit but many of the other plastic model kits 
dating from the same time period from many other plastic model manufacturers. And that has to do with the tolerances of the parts that may require a little bit more hand fitting compared to what we're used to seeing today on more contemporary kits. For example, on this model over here, this may be something you might run into with the way the row wheels are assembled. On this model, the row wheels slide onto the center axle found on the swing arm and then are held in place with the hubcap detailing. Well, on the places where the hubcap fit over the axle and where the hubcap not only secures to the center axle, but also with the way the hubcap fits into the recess here found on the row wheel, this is where you run the potential of coming across some very tight tolerances. This can be done from just with the way the pieces are molded and designed, or even like I said before, with the way the model is painted, you may have a layer or two of paint on, and this can cause the tolerances to shrink even further. If you do come across something like this, it's no big deal, and it's one that's very easily remedied with the use of either a pin vise, a needle file, or possibly even a Dremel. By slightly expanding the Look, the tolerances on some of these areas, this will make the piece slide into its location with a lot less effort and, most importantly, may prevent any sort of damage. If you're building a model, not just this kit here, but like I said, something along similar lines, and you're feeling a lot of resistance when it comes time for mounting these parts, you might want to stop and reevaluate because if you try to brute force the piece in place, this can definitely lead to issues. Namely, you can hurt the finish of the piece with the excessive handling when dealing with the part with your hand, but you also run the very real risk of potentially snapping off one of the plastic suspension pieces. Keep in mind, the axles are just injection molded polystyrene, and if you're really pressing onto the piece, trying to get it in place, and it's just not budging for one reason or another, something is probably going to give and you're going to end up snapping one of your axles. If this happens, it's not a total loss. You can repair it, like I mentioned before, with the idler method that I was briefly touching upon with the use of a needle and a pen. However, you can easily avoid this by just taking your time and just slowly evaluating when you're assembling these parts. If you come across any resistance to it, just open up the tolerances a little bit and then the piece can be inserted and you're probably going to have an easier time going through the final assembly. Moving from the suspension brings us to the rear plate and we'll start with the exhaust manifolds. The exhaust manifolds on this model here are the kit originals but have been tweaked in order to give them a little bit more detailing and slightly more accuracy. Starting with the exhaust covers, these did require a little bit of modifications in order to bring them up to the way you see it here. If I flip the vehicle over and go to the bottom portion, you'll see the very first mods that I made which are the cutouts found on these two sections here and here. This vehicle is just like with many of the other 135th scale King Tiger and King Tiger-ish vehicles that I've built throughout the years, namely the Amusing Hobby Low, as well as many of the Trumpeter E100s, feature a detail blemish where the bottom portion of these exhaust covers are solid and make contact with the rear wall. And on the real vehicle, that's simply just not the case. I believe it's done on the plastic models because it's probably easier to mold that way, but on the real vehicle, again, that's not going to be present. And the reason why is quite simply put, you don't want this area here to be closed off because this will easily fill up with water. If the vehicle is outside in a rainstorm, these things here will basically become like buckets and they'll hold the water in place. And why this is bad is again because of the exhaust manifolds. These units here are made from cast steel and get extremely hot. And the last thing you want to do is have those type of materials with that type of heat submerged in water for long periods of time because this will cause excessive amount of rust and will also lead for the parts to crack and break. So because of that, that's why we have the holes found on the bottom so any water that enters just floods directly out without puddling up. Fortunately, adding this little cutout is a very simple procedure. It's done either with a Dremel and a high speed removal bit or you can also use an ellipse type needle file. Both of those methods will give you the exact same result. The second bit of detailing that I made was with the addition of the Frankenstein lift bolts found on 
both sides of the exhaust cover. Just like I mentioned in the 1.6 scale King Tiger build that I'm doing, on the real vehicle, these units are extremely heavy and trying to put them on or take them off by hand is basically impossible. So this would be facilitated with a hoist. You have two cables that would come down, you would just loop them on these two sections here, and then this would allow you to either install or remove the cover without causing any physical injury, if you're lucky that is. On the model here, these were simply added with two small sewing pins and two holes were drilled in with a micro bit on a pin vise, giving you the detailing that we have. To round it off, some cast texturing was added to both of these units, sealing off the look and really making them pop compared to leaving them in their original format. From the covers, now brings us to the exhaust stacks themselves. These are the kit ones and the only modification I made was I drilled out the exhaust manifold sections, again with a small Dremel bit on a pin vise. When you're working with this type of a procedure on a scale that's this small, a pin vise and a nice set of small micro bits is definitely going to be something that is going to help you a lot. You can use a Dremel, but in my opinion, a Dremel might be a little overkill working on these because you run the risk of the bit either spinning too fast, which will melt too much plastic away from the surface over here and possibly causing damage. For something like this you want to go really slow and nothing beats a pin vise in my opinion for this type of a procedure. The remainder of the detailing found on the rear is stock which would include the mud flaps, the jack block, and the toe claws. Over here we have the tubular taillight and the reflector. These are both integrally molded into the model and all that's really required by the builder to make them pop is by adding the appropriate color paint. For the tubular taillight, a swipe of blue was added. Now when you apply the blue, don't go from end to end because keep in mind on the real one, there are two end caps which hold the tube in place. So to basically mirror that, when you're painting this with a very fine paintbrush, just stop slightly short of either end and you'll and this will give you the, look, the desired look. On the reflector here, just a simple drop of gloss red paint was all that was needed to give the reflector its nice shiny coat. Moving along to the sides of the model takes it to the Pioneer tools. All of these components are stocked with the kit and nothing really much to talk about with the exception of the gun cleaning staves, which again is another feature that I like to mention in these videos. When you're doing these German tanks, and this is true for not just the King Tiger, but the Tiger one as well, the staves would be in this type of format where the center portions are made from wooden rods, but the connecting ends are actually made from brass. On most small scale plastic models on the market, the staves are just modeled as straight up tubes or rods, I should say, and sometimes like on this kit here, you actually have the little male ends found on the connectors. When you're painting everything, in order to fully make the model pop further and to increase the accuracy, all you gotta do is with a swipe of gold paint, just add a little stripe on either end of the staves. This will give you the visual look of the brass and connectors that are found on these parts. And this is also a mirror image on the opposite side of the vehicle. And again, this is one of those steps that if you just go ahead and add, it's a really simple way to give your model a little bit extra kick without literally doing any sort of extra elbow grease or any other extra fabrication to your build. Just with a swipe of paint and boom, you're ready to go. From the Pioneer Tools brings us to the front of the vehicle and there's really nothing much to talk about. The Bosch light is completely stock with no mods being made as is the MG34 in its ball mount. The only addition that I did make was with again a micro bit on a pin vise, I drilled out the barrel section of the MG34. Again, if you don't have the experience or the tools to do this type of a procedure, you might want to sit this one out because you can easily screw it up and cause more damage as opposed to just leaving the piece totally stocked with a solid barrel end. While on the front here, you can also see some of the integral molded in detailing for both the tin work, namely the little straps, as well as the puzzle well features found on the upper and lower hulls. Note with this kit here, the weld lines are nicely done where that they meet each other absolutely perfectly, and it's again, these kits were actually pretty well designed for their era. From there, this now brings us to the rear engine deck, and the details that you see here are left predominantly stock out of the box. I did make one or two small little tweaks then, but basically what you see is what the kit gives you. 
One of the things I want to point out on the rear deck we're here are the grills. You'll notice that the grills are left completely stock and are absent their anti-grenade mesh work. And this is actually one of the more difficulties when it comes to working with a 148 scale tank kit. Keep in mind, this kit dates back to the 1970s and during this time, features like aftermarket grenade grills were not even on the radar. These would be something which would be developed and more prevalent on plastic model kits from the late 1980s throughout the 1990s and onward. Now, if this model was 135th scale, that wouldn't be a problem because in 135, there are so many options available for grill work, grenade grill specifically for a King Tiger, that if you throw a rock in any direction, you're probably gonna find two or three companies making a aftermarket set for you. Well, in 148 scale, you don't have that luxury. As far as I know, there are no 148 scale photo etch mesh sets that are on the market. So on this model here, I just rolled with the vehicle being left in its El Naturel form. Leaving the rear deck, by the way, in the strip down format is not necessarily an inaccuracy. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be getting comments in the video description asking me, well, John, can't you just take some fine PE match, cut it to shape, and mount it to these sections over here, giving you the detailing? And the answer is kind of, but really no. On the King Tiger, the pieces were very similar to what we've seen on the Panther, where you have a box frame which holds the meshwork to the square grills via the mount, the four mounting fasteners found on the top. And on the, on the round fan guard here, there's actually a little tube that is then spot welded to the fan grill. And that's also not to mention the large grenade grills, which were, which would have been mounted in these two sections over here. Trying to do this, I would have to fabricate these little box frames. And this is something that I just don't really have any interest in and something that would be way too time consuming. And honestly, the touch really isn't worth the squeeze for that. So I just left it with the strip down format that I have on this model. And like I mentioned before, that's not necessarily an inaccuracy because the grenade grills were something that were added after the vehicles were produced and were also something that were added once the vehicles were being fielded. So having the strip down format here is plausible. Believe me, it would be nice to have a full range of PE grills found on the back, but for the purpose of this build, I can live with the way you see it here. Having said that, I did add one little bit of mesh, and that was to the induction hole that we have here on the rear. It's just a little bit of mesh work, hopefully it pops up on screen, and it's just some spare PE mesh that I had lying around in one of my bins. From there it takes us to the fluid fillers. Here you can see, notice the weathering of the spilling that I've done which is something that I've been doing to a lot of my builds lately, and frankly, I like the way it comes out. On this side here, we have the antenna base. Now, on this model here, there is no antenna base detailing. It's just a hole found in this section here of the hull. On this model here, I fabricated the antenna base detailing by use, utilizing a small little piece of shrink tubing. The shrink tubing was added to the wire, shrunk in place with the heat gun, and then mounted to the vehicle. For paint work, it's basically simplistic and it's what you see on all of my other builds. The antenna wire itself is flat black. The bottom portion of the base would be rubber on the real German vehicle and the immediate portion here of the SEM is just painted with a little swipe of gold paint because it would be brass on the real vehicle. By just doing this little procedure here, the model's overall look and accuracy gets bumped up and it's something that really didn't require a whole lot of extra work to do. From the rear engine deck now takes to the bow hatches. Now on this model here, I actually made the hatches fully functional. They pivot out of the way and you get access to the hull interior. Now in order to make the bow hatches functional, this was actually a very simple modification to make because of the way the Bandai kit was designed. On the hatch moldings, there's a very long stem which makes this modification very simple because with a soldering gun you just melt a small little blob on the end portion of the hatch stem and this will effectively keep it in place without the use of any sort of adhesives. However what's really cool on the Bandai kit is not just that the hatches can open and close like the way you see it here but just like I did on my, on my Armatech builds the entire front section is molded separately which allows you to remove the whole front plate and get access to the front portion of the vehicle, 
which just like on the Armortech video that I just posted, is a really efficient and simple way to get into the bow section of the King Tiger. And while on that note, this now leads us to the interior detailing of the vehicle. But to get to the interior, let me first remove the turret, as well as the engine hatch, which is not glued onto this model and is only held on via friction. Looks like a lot of friction. The engine hatch out of the way. Here you get to see the interior detailing found on this model. Now it's going to be pretty tricky to get in frame with this lighting, so I'll go ahead and drop pictures of the interior that I took just before the model was fully sealed up and entered into paint. All of this vehicle's interior detailing that you see here is left completely stock and we're just supplied with the kit. The kit gives you sufficient amount of ammunition to fully equip the ammo racks on both the hull as well as on the turret. The Maybach HL230 does have its Cyclone detailing. However, there are no other interior detailings found on the engine compartment. It's just the engine placed directly in the center of the engine bay and the fan detailing and other cooling systems which are found on the real King Tiger are not present on this kit. From this point here, this actually makes a really good candidate for anyone that wants to roll their sleeves and possibly scratch build these components from hand or possibly even cat up a set and have them 3D printed, as well as many of the other details on the interior. The engine bay definitely has the least amount of details for the interior components, but the remainder of the interior, namely the fighting compartment, is pretty good. And again, just a little bit more elbow grease, if exhibited by the builder, can polish it up further from what the stock kit offers. You can see the torsion bar detailing underneath. It's pretty simplistic, but it gives you the idea of what's there. Now granted, this is a basically a grunt compared to the Symphony, which is found on the other 135th scale full interior King Tiger kits that have recently come out. And you could definitely see how much interior kits have progressed since the 1970s time period. Having said that though, these old Bandai kits do have a certain charm to them with their simplistic interior detailing found. On the turret, we have the crew compartment basket with all the other amenities which are found on the inside portion here of the King Tiger. On this model here, I also made the two hatches found on the turret roof functional as well, or not necessarily functional, but removable. And by doing this, this allows you to get better access onto the inside of the vehicle. On the King Tiger here, the rear hatch is not functional and just simply gets glued in place in its static format. Well, that's basically it for the interior. Let me go ahead and get the vehicle back together again so we can continue with the external detailing. Before I do though, I did recall that the one modification I did make was to the gun breech where I added the breech block detailing. Hopefully you can see it there through the commander's cupola. This was just fabricated out of a piece of plastic and once added and painted in, really enhances the interior portion of the gun breech, giving it just a little bit of extra detailing, which was absent on the stock kit. And with the turret back on, and you know what, for good measure, I'll leave the cupola hatch in the open position for the duration of this video. This now leads us to the turret. And the turret on this kit here is very nicely done. In fact, Bandai, in my opinion, did a phenomenal job in getting this turret rendered. It has all of the correct angles, slopes, and rounded curvature shapes, which is found on this pattern of turret. Compared to the more coffin box shape design found on the Henschel Tiger, the Porsche turret, in my opinion, was always a lot more sleeker in its shape. And honestly, between the two, I do prefer the Porsche turret, but that's more of a personal preference, I should say. One quirk I want to point out, though, is with the interior of this model, this does restrict the type of angles that you can display the turret in. With the way the basket and the corresponding floorboards line up in the vehicle, this allows you to have the turret mounted basically in most of the degrees found on the front of the vehicle and towards the sides. Where things get interesting is when you try to go towards the back. At this point here, you're going to start feeling a lot of resistance trying to rotate the turret because 
more than likely, it's slightly canted with the way the kit is designed and the basket is making contact with the floorboards. If you try to push it any further, you're just going to break your basket. So it's definitely something to keep in mind of if you are, if you have or are working on one of these older kits. This is also true for the opposite side as well. If you notice, I'm just going to rotate the turret until it wants to stop. And right there. If you notice, the turret is starting to lift upward off of the neck which definitely shows the piece riding up, there we go, on the interior floorboards. So if you're modeling this vehicle, either in a diorama, you might want to keep that in mind. However, for most display use, the turrets are generally positioned in the front direction or slightly contrapposto like that. So we'll go ahead and leave it in that format, which is perfectly fine and you're not going to encounter any sort of resistance found on the interior portion of the basket. While on the turret, one, some of the modifications I made were with the lift rings that we have here. On the original kit, these components were integrally molded into the surface detailing on the model and to further enhance the vehicle detail-wise, I amputated the molded in sections and replaced them with new ones fashioned from floral wire. This is another simple addition to make to your build to enhance it from the stock original offering. From the lift rings now takes to the front section here of the turret and this was one area where I did encounter a little bit of resistance on. With the way the turret is shaped with the, all of these compound of curves and angles in these sections over here, the front plate needs to pop onto the top portion of the turret which then also connects to the lower pan. Because of this you're going to have some fitting to contend with on these sections over here where all three panels meet. This is one area where a little bit of hand fitting was required and some body work was required in order to further delete any seam work which was found on this section over here. This is something to pay attention to if you're working on one of these old 148 scale Bandai King Tigers. Once everything is firmly fitted in place though and the body work is concluded, the piece looks absolutely seamless like the way you see it here. Another quirk that these kits have involved the main gun. With the interior detailing fitted, the main gun is very limited with the arc of motion of its elevation. Here you can see exactly how far the gun can go up and go down. Basically, it cannot go down past the point here, and it can go up eh, about, say, a quarter of an inch, if that. So again, this is another one of those quirks that these full interior kits do have. The reason, of course, is because with all of the interior detailing found on this portion here of the gun breech, it's making contact with some of the other equipment found on the inside, which on the real vehicle is what you need to elevate and depress the gun. But on the model here, if you want to elevate or render the model to have the gun in a elevated state, you are going to have to do a little bit more hand tweaking to some of the interior detailings. But for this build, again, stock was perfectly suffice for my needs. While on the main gun, this takes us to the mantlet. Now the mantlet on this model is a stock original component, but was tweaked from its original offering. You can see what it looked like stock in the pictures that are popping up on screen now, and in order to enhance it further, I went ahead and added some nice surface cast texturing which would be present on the real piece. Also, the piece needed just a little bit of hand fitting just so that the barrel portion found on the front area here was able to lock onto the inner detailing breech mechanism that was showcased earlier on in the video. Once the hand fitting was made, the piece just went together without any problems. And here you can see with the cast texturing added how much it really enhances the part and makes it stand out from its stock offering. From the manlet, this now takes to the remainder of the main gun. Now on this model here, this section, which on the real tank is integrally a part of the manlet, is actually connected to the remainder of the gun barrel, including the muzzle brake. And on this kit here, it's just like many other kits on the market, where the barrel is comprised of two halves that get glued together. This is something that is commonly seen, and with this type of a procedure, you are going to have a center seam line to contend with and polish away in order to get the look that we have here. However, on this model, the barrel has required a little bit more hand fitting that is typically seen on most other model kits. And again, this has to do with the age of the tooling on this kit. Vehicles from the 70s, this was something that was fairly common, specifically on a lot of these other Bandai kits. Like I mentioned, I believe, in the Nashorn video that I recently completed.
In order to do the procedure, it's not impossible. It just takes a little bit more elbow grease compared to what we typically see on two half barrel assemblies on other plastic kits that are on the market today. In order to do the procedure, I use some thick super glue, a needle file, and some fine sandpaper in order to polish everything down to the way you see it here in this video. And from there, this now takes to the paint and the markings. For the model's camouflage scheme, I went with a two-tone German camouflage pattern, which is the green airbrushed over the base coat of Dunkel Gelb. Markings, the kit does supply you with a set of water slide decals. However, just like I mentioned with the Hetzer build video, the decals that are supplied with the kit really didn't hold up well with age. The decal quality originally wasn't really the best, and after 50 plus years, they just weren't going to hold up. So rather than trying to roll the dice on them, I just threw them into my spare decal bin and went ahead and sourced markings elsewhere. The vehicle's crosses, I believe, were just scrounged from my spare decal bin. They are 135th scale from what I can remember, but they are on the smaller side of the German markings in 135th scale, which on 148th scale make them basically the perfect size. For the remainder of the markings, namely the tank's number and the division marking in the front corner, these were spare Bandai 148 scale tank decals, which were left over from the NAS horn that I recently completed. Like I mentioned in that video, the Bandai NAS horn that I built was a re-release from the 1990s. When Bandai re-released these kits, they also upgraded the quality of the supplied markings. They were the same exact markings with the pattern and the numbers and the layout, but were made on new printed stock. And the quality themselves were really, really good. Luckily, once that build was finished, I had some spare decals on hand left over from that kit to build the model from a, a couple different renditions. With those spare markings on hand, I was able to utilize them on this build here, completing it to the way you see it in this video. The quality of the markings that were used on this model were very good. They went on without any problems and were able to be lacquered in place without any other sort of issues that arose. Overall, they were the perfect cherry on the top of this build. In the end, I am really happy in how this build turned out. In fact, it came out way better than I would have originally anticipated. This model, like I said before, was one that has been sitting in the stash for pushing a decade now, so finally getting it out and getting it built and completed is definitely a personal victory and milestone for myself. One positive attribute though, because it sat in the shop for so long, it kind of acted like a time capsule, and by the time I was able to get to the build, I definitely had some skill sets and new painting techniques that in the end really made for the model to be a better build compared to if I would have built it, say, over a decade ago. So in that regard, it, was, it probably worked out for the best. And since these kits are relatively rare these days, they're not exactly that prolific as they were a number of years ago, so having the opportunity to build one up into the condition that you see here is another personal victory and it's something that always feels good whenever you get a model like this across the finish line. It's going to look absolutely perfect next to the other Bandai 148 scale models that I do have in my collection. From there, that's a good point to springboard us off into skill level and recommendation. Now, the model itself is a relatively simplistic kit with its detailing and with the way the model just fits with its construction. However, in my opinion, looks can be deceiving. This is really due to the hand fitting nature that's required on several of the parts and sub assemblies in order to assemble the model properly. If the pieces are not fully hand fitted in some cases, you're going to have some difficulties with getting them installed, which then can compound things further along the line of the build. This type of a trait is a common feature found on many of these older kits from this era. However, with these Bandai models, in my opinion, it's a little bit more compared to some of the other kit offerings from this period. This is amplified with the components for, for instance, the interior detailing. Because the interior detailing, everything needs to fit in a certain location, and in many cases, 
pieces just build upon each other. If someone is having problems getting pieces to align and fit together, this can have compounding results when it comes time to flesh out the remainder of the model's interior detailing. Now, don't get me wrong, the parts are not horrifically bad compared to some other models on the market, and they do go together fairly well. But for a beginner who may not have the skill set, the experience, and even the tools required to know what to look for and exactly how to handle it when, it come, when he comes across it, this may be something that a little bit of a hurdle for this type of an individual. Something like this would be best done for someone who's already has the skills ironed out, so when they encounter something like this, they can instantly shift into gear and know exactly how and what to do when they encounter something along those lines. Because of that, a model like this, I really recommend for someone who's more or less an intermediate builder, who's already had a few builds under his belt, and knows exactly how to come across a situation like that if it may present itself. Intermediate builders aside, an advanced builder can easily tackle one of these models. If you don't want to build it out of the box, one of these type of individuals who have this type of skill set can take this stock model and really enhance it further from this point. Because the model does have some basic interior detailing and interior layouts, this is a great canvas to add upon with scratch built components. However, keep in mind, because the model is 148 scale, you are going to be a little bit limited compared to the type of aftermarket accessories that you'll find in larger scales, namely in 135. But if the person is really good at scratch building, or they have access these days to a 3D printer and know how to use CAD, you can really polish one of these models up into something that really was not in anticipated when these kits were originally designed back in the 70s. And this plugs us into now recommendations. Now, because of what this model is, in my opinion, there are going to be several groups of people who may be very interested in acquiring one of these models into their collection. First and foremost, this is a vintage plastic model kit, and there are people out there who just collect model kits like this one over here. These people generally don't like to build these kits as they like to keep them for their collector value. On a similar note, because this is a Bandai plastic model kit, there is a small little niche community out there of individuals who seek out and collect these kits that we have here. The models, like I said before, Bandai did release quite an extensive range of 148 scale plastic kits. So as a collector, it's a nice little fertile market to get into and they do get addicting trying to build up your collection stash. In my opinion, the Porsche King Tiger was one of the better kits that was released by Bandai in their 148 scale lineup. And on a separate note, during this time period in the 1970s, Bandai released another King Tiger kit, but in 125th scale. And hopefully one day I'll be able to get my hands on one to do a proper video review because they are really, really cool kits. They have a lot of cool features and functions to them, and it's something I definitely want to get on video. However, if anyone is fortunate enough to have either the kit or a built rendition of that kit in their collection, perhaps they might want to also obtain one of these 148 scale Bandai Porsche Tigers just to basically round out your Bandai King Tiger collection. That way you have both the big and little brother of this vehicle. Another really good benefit that 148 scale has for armor, specifically for diorama use, is the infrastructure. 148 scale is a very active scale specifically with model aircraft. Because there are a lot of model airplane kits on the market as well as model airplane accessories on the market, this allows you to mix the two genres together and can, if you're clever enough and creative enough, come up with a really interesting scene where you can have planes interacted with your AFE diorama. This kit is also recommended for anyone who's a fan of World War II German armor. And if you're the type of person that have already built several King Tigers on 135th scale, perhaps you might want to stretch your legs a little bit and try something new in 148. Something like this would definitely be a nice addition to your collection, even if it's just a conversation piece. However, I do want to point out that there are some downsides to these older kits, namely with availability, which also tends to lead to cost. 
For a number of years, the Bandai 148 scale kits were something that they were out there. They were somewhat easy to track down, but weren't nearly as prolific as some of the other kits that I built on this channel in the past, namely in 135. However, sadly, the amount of kits that I've seen on the market have definitely been on the decline. And with the decline of these kits, collectability of them now goes up, which also raises the price. Like I said earlier in the video, occasionally you might come across one in the wild that is for a really affordable price. And if you do come across one and think you might want to stretch your legs a little bit and try something outside of your norm with your typical building projects, perhaps one of these Bandai 148s might be something to look into. I also want to point out that at the moment Bandai doesn't have any desire to re-release any of their old vintage military vehicle kits. So what's on the market is on the market. Hopefully one day this might change because Bandai have had periods where they were re-releasing older pattern kits. However, with their current management, that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case these days. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 148 scale vintage Bandai Porsche King Tiger heavy tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being smaller scale model showcase videos like this guy over here or the larger project update videos that frequently get posted on this channel. Another way to keep in loop with new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been showcased on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Till next time.